Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Douglaston Development, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffin Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American. People love owning property in Manhattan. People love building in Manhattan. But not everybody has the vision of taking a building, recreating it, and molding it. Today, I'm very fortunate to have David Levinson, Chairman and CEO of l and Holdings, on my show. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. You know, I always tell people, I'm a Brooklyn born. I was born in Brooklyn. You were born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn. And you were born at, at Maimonides Hospital. But then your, your dad, your mom and dad moved out to Valley Stream. Now, people think of Valley Stream in Long Island, you know, they think of the Green Acre Shopping Center. You told me when you moved out to, Green, to Valley Stream, there was a farm next to you, right? There was a farm. That's right. There was a farm, March Drive. It was March Farm. And it seemed like I came home one day from school and it turned into March Drive. I mean, they were, they, I thought they were growing carrots and they were growing houses. And that's what happened. <laughs> but, but then you, you, your dad, let him rest in peace, you said to me, had a, the toy store, the, the a hobby shop, right. right? It was the hobby shop uh, on Union Turnpike. Right. And uh, so you graduate high school, Valley Stream High School. Right. You went to Southampton College for right. a year. What were you doing right. up there? Well, there I was sort of getting my act together. You know, it was a it was a uh, a nice school. It, it was um, the freshman class had 400 students. The senior class they didn't have a graduating class yet. It was only the fourth year. It was had 40 kids, um, and it was a very nice place for me to go and sort of figure out. Did what, you play some what softball was I there, do? or you played softball in high school? I played, played baseball. I played ball in high school. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so then you said, hey, enough of this joking around in Southampton, nice place, you decide to go to Northeastern right. uh, in Boston, who had a very interesting program called the Cooperative Education Program, one of their best programs, and they still have it today. And at, at Northeastern, um, you had the opportunity to, to, to work and you know, you go to school and work, and you get a job at New England Telephone. Right. So right. what happens at New England Telephone? Yeah. And, uh, casually known as the phone company. You know, this was the highly regulated era, um, not at all the way it is today. Um, and I had considered one of the better jobs that you could get. It was for the director of business research. And we worked um, on special projects for the top five or six executives. And then we also did a monthly economic uh, journal. I was an economics major, so it was you know, CPI, growth, those types of statistics. Um, but uh, and, and you had the opportunity to, to eat lunch in the executive <laughs> dining room, right? I got to eat lunch in the executive dining room. And uh, they had a project, which was a real estate project. Um, it was a 
typical buy versus lease of a site, you know, for them to build a plant. Um, so I worked on that project and I kind of got very, very interested in the real estate aspect of it. But, you know, you, you bring up this great opportunity. I had to have lunch um, with the executives in the executive dining room. It really was a, it was a great, great spot because you really had access to the leaders of the company. And they took a shine to me. They liked me and, you know, I liked working for them. And it was uh, one afternoon, you know, one of the executives uh, that I worked for there, a vice president, said to me, you know, David, you know, we hope that when you leave your co-op period with us, when you go back to school and then come back and join us again. We think you'd be great to work here at, at uh, the, the phone company. And, you know, you, if you think about it, you, in 18 years, something like 18 years, you could actually become a vice president of the phone company. Now, I was 18 going on 19 at the time he said that. So when he was trying to encourage me to think about the phone company for as a career, it kind of shocked me. It was like, in 18 years, I could become a vice president. In those days, vice president was really a high-level position. You know, it's not like today where everyone has inflation of titles. You start out, you're a vice president. There, there really only were a small number of vice presidents. And um, I was just kind of taken back by the idea of one working at the phone company and taking 18 years to emerge to a level of vice president. From an, looking from an 18-year-old perspective, it was just a thousand years. So, and the, but but they did a big favor for you. They sponsored yes. you, uh, so you can get a real estate that's license. Right. I went to them and, t and told them that that's really what I wanted to do, and they were very supportive of that. And they did. And they did. They so, sponsored so me. David Levinson, the kid from Valley Stream, starts creates the Bostonian Development Company. <laughs> right. That was that was a, a little uh, later on after I was uh, I, I was an apartment rental agent. I rented apartments to the students. I still carry with me every day in uh, my uh, my briefcase and with me every day is my commission book, and it's really astounding. If you know Boston, you'll look at the Comet Wealth Avenue and Cleveland Circle addresses, um, where the commissions were. Um, we got half of half of a month's rent. So if a month's rent was one hundred and fifty dollars, which was a pretty good rent then, you know. It was $75 was the gross, I got $37.5. So you see in my book, commissions of $37 and $25, and um, there's actually a couple that are still didn't get paid on. Um, we'll see what happens one day. But, but after um, doing that, then I, then I decided I wanted to start renovating buildings, and I formed as what you identified as the Bostonian Development Company. And I was very, very proud of that. You know, I was the president of the Bostonian Development Company, and we renovated buildings. Hey, you renovated and you did business. And now, but you said to me, you really like skiing and, and you, you know, you're like a ski bum and you're graduating college and you, you speak to your dad and you say, there's this place called Woodstock and I could buy 300 acres in Woodstock and we can really develop over here. And what happens over there? Well, we, we searched around and we found this site in Woodstock and, um, you know, uh, finding a mountain that is suitable is, it's not just a matter of elevation. Um, it's a matter of uh, the direction that it faces, the annual snow accumulation. I mean, it's quite a, uh, you know, a scientific process to go through. And we had brought in Hall Ski Lift, which at the time, probably still today, I don't know for sure, but at the time was the major manufacturer of, of uh, ski lifts. And they looked at sites and helped us evaluate the sites. Um, and we did, we identified this project, uh, this property, uh, Mount Tysatonic in uh, Woodstock, New York, um, which was very suitable for skiing and, and attracting and holding snow and face the right direction. And uh, we acquired it, it was about 360 acres. Um, I was just about finishing college at the time, so this is 71, 72. And um, I moved uh, to uh, Woodstock. Um, for a time, I didn't have a really place to live. I actually lived in a, a cabin uh, with um, no electricity and nothing. I actually had water coming from the outside um, stream that we would heat up. And we had raised some money, and we made the acquisition. And we were kind of doing it on, on a very tight, tight As we were a shoestring? It was clearly on a shoestring. My dad had a toy store, and <coughs> we didn't have a whole lot of money. And so it was just uh, a purchase money mortgage that we got from the farmer. We put down a couple of dollars and got control of the property. <coughs> and then we started going through uh, 
the approval process, which, which was, was a nightmare. A nightmare. And then the Just interest incredible. rates were twenty percent. Yeah. And basically, you lost everything except for eleven acres, which you still have today. Correct. Now you come back to New York, a little downtrodden, one would say. <laughs> And really you come back and you find an old girlfriend, you move into her place, and that doesn't work out. And then David Levinson, the man who's the chairman and CEO of LNL, becomes homeless. Tell me what I, the homeless. Well, I came back. The, the last dollars that I had, I used, uh, had a lot release clause in my mortgage with the, the farmer that owned the land. And, I, and this was the keystone piece. So I released that piece to, with the idea of someday returning. You know, like MacArthur, you know, I will, re I will return, and someday my family will because it's in in uh, the family planning and the will that that should never be sold. It is the, you can't develop that site without this keystone. So I used everything I had and we acquired that. And I still own it, and then I came back to New York, penning, basically penniless. I think I had like eleven dollars or something like that, and moved in with uh, a gal who I thought was my girlfriend, but she wasn't really my girlfriend because she wasn't coming home at night. So imagine how tough that was. I mean, I lost everything and, and more. So I really couldn't stay there. Um, so I was out. I was homeless. I had a fold-up cot. And I would stay at a friend's or a cousin's or outside. I mean, there were times I stayed outside in the city. And um, it, was, uh, it was very difficult. Um, and now you, and you even was. applied for food stamps. Yes, a little shortly after that, um, I uh, applied for food stamps. I, I got food stamps. I got eighty dollars a month, which uh, even in uh, the early seventies was not enough to survive on. So, so, so you were very interesting, and, and you said, "Hey, it was a great way for me to f f uh, to feed myself." The New, <laughs> the New York Hilton Hotel. That's right. Tell me the story right. about that. Well, I mean, if you go there and, you know, at 5.30, the cocktail party started, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock, and then they go into the black tie event. So I would always go to the Hilton Hotel. You had a sport jacket. You know, between, I had a jacket. I, I couldn't, I didn't have sleeves under my shirts, but, but I had a jacket, and I would go to the ballroom floor, go to the cocktail parties, and that's where I would be, have my main meal was, you know, the Swedish meatballs and the celery sticks and, and the egg rolls. And I still go once in a while. It's still very good. So after that... From in the neighborhood, I always stop by. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but the interesting situation is afterwards you meet this Barton Menzen? It was, it was around that time. It was uh, a little foggy, but it was around the time that I had applied for food stamps. I, had, uh, I, needed, a, I needed a place to live. I mean, I couldn't keep staying at friends, and I couldn't keep staying outside. Um, so I uh, was looked for an apartment. I looked in the, in the... I had no money. I didn't know exactly how I was going to do this. But I hooked up with a fellow by the name of Barton Menzen, who had just renovated a uh, little brownstone on uh, West, West 83rd, 83rd Street, Street, between Riverside and West End, a beautiful neighborhood. And I convinced him to rent me the most difficult apartment, which is the first, the top floor top walk floor, up. Top floor, five-story five walk up, 17 yeah. by 17 room. Uh, very, very, very good memory. Um, uh, and I convinced him that I would be good for the rent, and I didn't have a job. I told him my story, and hard to believe that a, a New York landlord attorney would be so kind um, and empathetic, but he was. And so I, I had a place now to live. I had no furniture, um, but I had a roof over my head and a bathroom and a kitchen, and uh, so it was really quite nice. And over the years, I, we became friends, and I actually helped him out on some real estate. So later stuff. on, you know, you want to get back into the real estate business. You know, you decided, hey, I'm homeless. I'm no longer there. I'm going to go there. At least now I have a phone. And you get a job with a legendary Hank Sofer right. renting apartments. Right, right. Um, Seventy-five dollars a week, uh, which was uh, okay. I mean, I had some money. $25. And twenty-five dollars every apartment that we rented, we got a twenty-five dollar bonus. And there were days where they would shuffle you around from different buildings to different buildings. And there were times when I'd have two buildings that were sort of side by side on on East End Avenue. And um, you know, I, I was I was mobile now. I actually was earning some money, not a whole lot, uh, but I was in the flow of, of uh, potential opportunities. So now what happens is Hanks offered this opportunity with his owner, Nathan Ratner, uh, in Staten Island, which definitely was too far away, the bridge, and you get the opportunity. Now, Hank 
wanted to lease the building, which had birds, pigeons, yeah. garbage, and everything. It was in terrible Total, shape. 100% vacant. 100% vacant, 145 apartments. And you had a different idea. You said, this is a building that I could lease to corporations. I could go to banks who were on training programs, and basically, Hank didn't get the job, and you took the job. Right. Barton gave you two to $3,000, you leased the car, you had this situation, and over a short period of time, you leased up all of the apartments, and you went to Barton, and you said, you owe me 45000 What happened? Well, you know, it was a very successful program. We were close to downtown. Um, where there was a lot of the corporations, and uh, it happened so fast. He was advancing me money because I needed money just to get back and forth and to rent the car because you, you couldn't keep the, constantly taking the, the subway and, and the, uh, the ferry. Bus. It, was an, it was three hours of traveling every day. So it was so successful that I got ahead of the draw that he was giving me in a matter of a few months. And I think it was six or nine months. We had everything sort of leased up. We furnished the apartments. We had uh, a furniture rental company came in and furnished them. And um, now he owed me $45,000. He calls me down to his office. He says, David, I want to thank you very much. You saved me. You know, I was going to lose these buildings, but I'm not paying you the money I owe you. Leave. I thought he was joking. I literally thought... And you were smoking joking. a cigar, you said. Yeah, you always smoked very big cigars. <clears throat> I literally thought he was joking. So I kind of laughed and I said, that's f funny, I appreciate you, know, you acknowledging that I saved you. When do you think I could start getting this money? And he said, I'm not going to pay you. Leave now. I'm calling security. And he called security. So I was out of there. I was devastated. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe that this really happened. But... You know, it was sort of welcome to New York City, you know, commissions. So now you go out there and you start making phone calls. You, you want to become a commercial broker. Right. Uh, but you had one problem. You still have that beard. I had you, this you beard. You had this beard. You right. like this beard. And you go out there and... Nobody wants to hire you, but you meet this guy at this Loth brokerage firm. I mean, this firm called Williamson Company. Right. And Jack? Jack Fader. Jack yeah. Fader. And he says, kid... I." I think the comment you said to me, you said to him is, don't worry, I'll make a lot of money for you. Yeah, I had been, he was interviewing me over the phone. I had been turned down by all the big name firms, because, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, and Jack started asking me to describe myself. I was giving him my background. He said, no, 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 tell me about yourself physically. How big are you? Blah, blah, blah. I told him, you know, I was 5'11", it was that. I had hair on my head, but I had a beard. When I got to the beard, he was done. You know, I figured I had to tell him that because I had already been rejected because of that. Um, and I was a little kind of angry, and I kind of said, listen, I'm going to make a lot of money in this business. You know, do you want to share in it? It was that kind of approach I had. And he said, come over, come in at 3 o'clock. I went over there and uh, I got the job. So you get the job, but they didn't really know if you were going to really last. So it, it was three months before they gave you a business card, right? right? They typed my name in a blank business card for three months. Now, how much can it cost to print business cards in 1976? I mean, it can't cost much, but that's how they did it. It wasn't the most impressive card when I would give to someone. And it was, you know, typed. And you could see it was typed because those, we didn't have computers. It was a IBM Selectric, you know, the ball, you know, typewriter. Right, the ball. So now, now, the interesting thing is, since you were you're doing well and Jerry Cohn realized you were doing well, uh, on your way to the Hilton one night, uh, there was this company called Down Communication, uh, and they had like 5,000 square feet to lease in this building at that time called the Burlington Building, 1345 Avenue in the Americas. And you go up there and you meet Cubby. I, uh, I, I go up there. The receptionist, of course, is, you know, not... It was like 6 o'clock at night. Um, she didn't want to let me in. I persuaded her to let me in and walk around and take a look at the facilities. I'm walking, walking around. She's showing me where the spaces that they want. They had about 12,000 altogether, and they wanted to chop off 5,000 feet. And uh, as a young man sitting in one of the offices, he comes out, introduces himself, Cubby Down. It was Ed Down's son, two wonderful people, very prominent people. He says to me, let me show you what we're going to do. He Shows me where he's going to demise it. I say to him, as we're leaving, I said, you can't, by the way, you can't do this because 
you need different means of egress and your 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 lighting circuit recircuiting your air conditioning re reducting i mean this is a very very complicated thing um i you might not be able to do it the way you're planning and i left and then went over to the hilton uh, a couple of weeks later I, I he took my business card a couple of weeks later he calls me up and says i want to take you to lunch well takes you to orsini's orsini's i mean Pretty much at that point, I would go anywhere for lunch. Um, but to be invited to go to Orsini's, I didn't ask any questions. I said, yes, you know, what time? We went there, and he told me that uh, he had interviewed a lot of brokers, and no one had told him about all the complications of demising the space the way he had planned. Um, he checked with his architect. I was right, and, you know, he wanted to hire me. I didn't really go there f to try to get the listing. I was actually thinking I had a customer potentially that wanted to be in that building. And, um, but, I mean, this guy took me to a great meal and wanted to hire me, and it was a very, very so, amiable guy. So what guy. happens with Elizabeth Arden? Because that was a crowning achievement for you, and I think a career ch achievement and a life achievement, because you met the Fisher family, you met... Yeah, that was a um, really pivotal moment when the, I, I accepted that work with the Down family, um, that 5,000 feet turned into, they decided they wanted to get rid of all the space. Knock, knock, next door, it's Elizabeth Arden. They wanted the space. I started, they took it. I, a relationship with me and Elizabeth Arden uh, started. I actually did the world headquarters for Elizabeth Arden three times, uh, you know, during uh, that part of my career. Um, I did the deal with the Fishers owned that building at that particular point, so I became friends with Tony Fisher. Tony, the late Tony Fisher, was one of my closest friends. Um, Arden was became very good good friends of mine. I mean, it just it just really really gave me momentum, and I, I, that was sort of the launching of my my career uh, in the brokerage business. That's right, <clears throat> and that did because three years later. Over a three-year period, you, you were made a partner at Williams and Company, right. and the Williams and Company has produced a lot of great people, including yourself, out of that. Uh, and as you said to me, you know, you learn from Jerry Cohn, yeah. Ken Car uh, Bob and Ken Carmel, yeah, Bob and Ken Carmel, and Stanley Stahl, the legendary Stanley Stahl. Yeah. I, I didn't mention that you were one of the owners of the Yankees, but you know, you in 1988, you said, "Hey, I've had a good run with Williams, but you know what? I really want to put myself up on the." On the free agent, right? The right. free agent line. Yeah, I, listen, I saw that the the business really needed a big change. You know, the, the, the skills of negotiating skills and market knowledge, which was basically the core element of the commercial leasing brokerage business in those days, it really needed to be different. You needed to have many more skills and provide much more in the way of service. And Williams really wasn't organized to provide that because it was more overhead and you had to have more support. Um, I had this idea, so I decided where, how was I going to go re recognize and realize my, my vision on this thing. And I had talked to really only two organizations that came down to one was Goldman Sachs, who was thinking about going into this business, and Ed Gordon, who um, re recognized the same thing that I recognized, that the business had to go through a transformation. And he had already started the transformation. He had brought in uh, a few years earlier. Marty Turchin, one, the legendary Marty Turchin, one of the great, all-time great uh, brokers and strategic thinkers. He had John Powers with him, who, which was uh, a, a very bright, intelligent guy, also working on this project. And Ed wanted me to join it, and uh, Ed offered me a million dollars to sign the contract in 1988. And let me tell you, a million dollars is a lot today. It was really a lot of money in 1988. Right. So you go to Eddie. And, but you really, you know, it's, it's 1988, 1998, 10 years later, you said, you know what, I want to really go back to that Bostonian development company. Sure. I, I really have the, the, the yearning to go into business to own real estate. And you, and you test the water and you buy this building out in Long Island. Huntington Quadrangle. Right. Uh, quadrangle. And you do well, you sell it and everything there. You bring a guy who's your partner today, Bob, uh, Robert, Robert Lapidus, yeah. and then it's 2000. And what happens in 2000? Well, um, that's when uh, <coughs> Rob Lapidus joined me. Um, it's a classic story. You know, we sat down. We, we knew each other from the Huntington Quadrangle transaction. Um, we had a single one-page bullet point term sheet. We signed it, shook hands, and kind of just launched the business. And in, in 2000, you bought five properties. We, had, we ac actually acquired three. 
Um, we, uh, which turned into many more, but you know, one of the questions, you know, Rob and I said, well, gee, I wonder how long it's going to take for us to really get going here, and how was the community going to react to this? Um, there was a public opportunity issue because we were on the New York Stock Exchange, and also the, how was the brokerage community, you know, were they going to be supportive, not supportive? We really sort of didn't really know. You just never know what's going to happen. Um, as it turned out, the brokerage community was incredibly supportive. Um, I, I would give a, a big chunk of my uh, of the success of our company to the relationships that Rob and I have built over the years, because a lot of people wanted to see us succeed, and uh, they 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 were very supportive. The, the f second week that we were had formed the business, um, Rob gets a phone call from the Carlisle Fund, and they are negotiating a contract to buy a building on uh, uh, West 39th Street. Um, not exactly the kind of building that you would think they would buy or that we would buy. It was a manufacturing building. But they knew Rob and they had, they had known my reputation and they had um, called him up and said, do you want to be our operating partner? Well, we were just kind of like blown over. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do to become an operating partner for someone like yeah. Carlisle out of the box. And we just said yes. It was the worst business deal we ever made, um, but it didn't matter because that immediately led to a relationship with Carlisle. And you've had great relationships with <coughs> other investors. I mean, we have only like a minute and a half, and I really want to get to... So you bought that building, you bought 195. You've owned... Metropolitan you own Tower. Metropolitan Tower. From 155th Avenue. Right. Uh, and I think, one of, and I think one of the, the major things that you've really accomplished is taking over the toy building. Yeah. And because the, the toy building was the toy building, it needed major work. And you and Rob really have taint, turned it around. It's the home of Italy. You know, everybody knows the building. You've got Avon, you've got Tiffany. Tiffany. You have everybody over there. Um, on a quick side, you get involved with the Yankees um, because you played uh, hardball when you were in high school. And... As you said to me, you want you and Rob want to keep this like the Fisher families. You want to keep this as a private company for the family. Yeah, we think of it. You know, it started out as the Fisher model in in 2000 um, as a private business. We're going to continue with that. I think we we'd like to think of ourselves more now shifting a combination of the f the, the family business and a company like Related, which is uh, larger, uh, stocked with a lot of great talent. You know, we've opened up a residential division. We opened up an office in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's really about the talent, and it's a much, uh, right. you much have bigger your son, organization. Your, your son is at CB. I have one. My oldest son is at <coughs> CB, is Richard Dallas, right. right now, yes. And you have how many children? Four altogether. I have uh, Chris, who's at CB. I have Matthew, who's a fabulous uh, musician. And then I have my little James, who's eight years old, who's in second grade. And, and? I have my little daughter, who's uh, three. So I, I got to say, for the guy who is homeless from the Bostonian Development Company, uh, you have truly become a builder of New York and around the world, and I'd like to thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure. Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Douglaston Development, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American.